Hi. How are you doing? I was just asking about you. You were? Yes. Yes. Awesome. People are starting about. to come in. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started in a few moments. Let's see, we have a lot of people coming in. Welcome everyone, happy Friday. People are trying to get educated this Friday. Well, they're gonna get some education today. <laughs> As my grandmother would say. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yep. Welcome, welcome. I have our little cheat sheet up as well. And I have all the links. So we'll be adding um, a lot of the, the links that we're talking about today. They'll be in the chat. So we'll go over that as well. Oh, Natasha Ellis said, yes, <laughs> always love to be edumacated. Edumacated. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have 88 people already. It's not, oh, just turned 12. So welcome everyone. We will get started. We're gonna give everyone a few minutes to log in. Thank you, Angela. She said, good afternoon. Thank you for presenting on such a much needed topic. So definitely welcome Tracy. We already have a lot of comments in the chat. Cheryl Coney. So welcome, Tamika, Sandra. All right, so we're gonna give a couple more minutes, guys. We need our. Um, we had to have our our theme music playing. I know. I was waiting. <laughs> We have to have like our opening song. I need to make that a uh, note from when we're waiting in the waiting room. I, I was definitely running through my Rolodex, you know, <laughs> DJ brain this morning, like we should have music. <laughs> and I, I, all I could think of was R&B. So I was like, I don't know about that. <laughs> so usually we do have a song. Um, one of our presenters does great with that. He always has like a song to bring us in. And it, it usually is R&B song. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh no, so next time. Yucatan, Mexico. Wow, welcome Alexia. Alexia? Wow, we're having people check in from all over. So we're at 117, guys. And I think I'm just gonna do our intro for, the, um, for our Zoom meeting. Um, welcome everyone for our OCD in the Black community. I'm just going to go over a couple of the house rules um, while people are still checking in. This is a webinar, so you won't be able to unmute, but you'll be able to add your questions in the chat. So you should have a little bar at the bottom that you can um, click the chat or the Q&A. But Dr. Chapman is going to get the questions at the end of the presentation. So um, just we'll co be compiling the questions and making sure they can get answered then. And so I know the OCD found um, Mid-Atlantic and BMHA may be new to um, a lot of the people on the line. At the end of the presentation, we'll um, really be able to answer a lot of those questions about how you can connect with us. 
Um, for CEUs, at the end of the presentation, you'll be able, you have to fill out a survey monkey that has the objective questions um, and it'll collect your proper name to add on that certificate. So just keep that in mind. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce Mr. Richard Rowe. He will be um, talking a little bit about Black Mental Health Alliance. He is the director of our training institute. Hello, Mr. Richard Rowe. Hello, Ms. Roxana Thinkster. Glad <laughs> to be here this afternoon. Welcome, everyone, as Roxana has greeted all of you, and we are uh, definitely pleased that you have found your way to this really important webinar that the Black Mental Health Alliance is sponsoring today. Um, and we are glad that you uh, are able to be with us this afternoon. Uh, Roxana indicated that I will basically be giving a, a, little, a very, very brief um, opening remarks about uh, the Training Institute. Uh, the Training Institute is something that we uh, believe is important for uh, our community to, to, to bring critical and important issues and topics to our mental health professionals that are culturally grounded, culturally responsive, uh, that are basically designed to really share our story and our perspective on a number of critical issues that impact our overall mental health and well-being. And so the uh, slide lists some of the uh, some of the topics that we have basically brought to the community and have shared with our mental health professionals, and there's so many, many more. And so it is really, truly an honor to really be in, a part of the Institute. And you can look forward to some great, great, great uh, upcoming sessions that will cover air issues like this one that we are about to hear from uh, an exciting, exciting presenter and a very gifted, talented presenter this afternoon. So again, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I want to, again, on behalf of the Black Mental Health Alliance and our executive director, Ms. Andrea Brown, and our entire BMHA team, especially uh, everyone who took part, had a part in bringing this powerful session to you. Um, I'm speaking about Roxana, who is always on the case and always uh, uh, on the scene to really assist and to help us with uh, these types of um, efforts, uh, along with uh, Cheryl Maxwell, who will be helping with the issuing of the CEUs uh, to those of you who are requesting them. But this is the work that we are doing, and we are proud of the work that we're doing. Let me, just, before I end my brief, brief comments, let me just share with you um, a brief little tale about a friend of mine who had OCD. And this is what he said to me some years ago. He, this was a friend of mine who said that I suffered from OCD in silence for almost nine years. And those nine years he, he shared with me were the most darkest moments of his life. Uh, he was able to get psychological or professional therapeutic help um, in 2019. But in that time, you know, he basically uh, felt that he was misunderstood and misdiagnosed on a number of occasions. So this is a very, very critical topic, you all. And I know those of you who are on the call understand that and know that, but I have a couple of friends and a couple of associates who basically suffered from OCD. So I can't wait to hear more from our speaker. And I don't wanna give it away. I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Rodriguez, who is going to introduce our speaker and say, say a little bit more about the OCD Mid-Atlanta Atlantic uh, Organization. Dr. Rajikas. Thank you so much, Mr. Rowe. I, um, I'm truly excited about today and welcome to today's talk, not just on obsessive compulsive disorder, but obsessive compulsive disorder in the black community. Um, we discussed this during um, Black Lives Matter, how can the OCD Mid-Atlantic Board get more involved? And um, we found luckily the Black Mental Health Alliance and their training institute we're truly um, honored to be partnering with them today to really decrease the stigma, increase awareness and educate the community, close that gap and access to mental health treatment in your community. So thank you so much for being here. The OCD Mid-Atlantic um, is an affiliate, um, a nonprofit affiliate of the International OCD Foundation. Um, we're locally based. Um, we're made up of people in, with OCD and related disorders, as well as their families, friends, professionals, 
um, treating um, sufferers and others. We mainly focus on uh, our services and education toward Maryland, Washington, DC, and the Northern and Central Virginia region, which is a pretty large region um, or area to cover. And for that reason, we try to partner as much as we can um, to make sure we reach out all areas as much as possible. Uh, we welcome any recommendations, any um, needs, um, and you can find a lot of our information on the ocdmidatlantic.org website where future events and inquiries can be made to make sure that we're providing what you need and bringing to you what you need. Our mission is really to educate the public and professionals about OCD in order to, again, increase awareness and improve the quality of treatment that's provided in the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, we'd like to improve access to resources for those with OCD as well as their families. We know that this is not just something that affects one individual, but we, we know that it affects the entire family and network. And we also like to advocate and lobby for the community in the Mid-Atlantic region. So um, we hope that you enjoy today's talk um, and consider joining future events um, and helping us in our mission, okay? So um, Dr. Chapman um, has a very long resume. <laughs> He's done a lot of wonderful things and I'm just gonna give you a little synopsis, but you do have his very long prestigious um, resume and, and CV in general. We're really happy to have him. Um, Dr. Chapman is a licensed clinical psychologist, founder and director of the Kentucky Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders, where he specializes in the assessment and treatment of anxiety disorders and related disorders. Dr. Chapman is a diplomat and certified by the Academy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapists and is a nationally recognized expert in the implementation of cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety and related disorders. Additionally, Dr. Chapman serves as a consultant for the creation of evidence-based anxiety treatment protocols due to his additional expertise related to the intersection of multiculturalism and mental health. Furthermore, Dr. Chapman has published numerous papers in scientific journals and has written several chap book chapters. He is a faculty member of the Behavioral Therapy Training Institute, known as BTTI, for the International OCD Foundation and serves on its clinical and advisory board. Dr. Chapman serves on several editorial boards, including the Journal of Anxiety Disorders and Clinical Child and Family Psychologists Review. Without further ado, uh, we have Dr. Chapman. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, I am from Kentucky, so I will say y'all quite a bit. So be prepared for that, right? I am who I am, so I'm honored to be here. And uh, this topic is obviously near and dear to my heart for a whole lot of reasons. So uh, you can't talk about mental health related activity, especially um, with people of color, generally speaking, and black folks specifically without talking about social justice and how that impacts things. So, you know, I'm excited about this talk um, just because not only are we going to talk about OCD and what specifically it is, because now that I have folks attention, I want to keep in mind that, you know, I always like to bust, bust some myths as well as we talk about these things, because most people use that term kind of pejoratively, like, oh, you saw OCD and things like that. So we're going to talk about OCD generally, but we're also going to get real specific as well. So I'm just excited to be here. So I'm going to jump in, share my screen, um, and we'll go from there. All right. Okay. All right, so let's get into it. So what we're gonna talk about throughout this presentation is what is OCD? So we're gonna talk about common myths associated about what OCD isn't, right? As opposed to what it is. We're gonna talk about the criteria of OCD uh, in terms of how we diagnose it, the prevalence rates of OCD, the treatment of OCD. So we're gonna have a lot of time spent on talking about OCD generally and what we know about it and how we go about treating it, but then we're gonna get into the specifics of the cultural factors associated with OCD. I'll be using a number of terms. Sometimes I'll say African-American, sometimes I'll say Black Americans, sometimes I'll say BIPOC, because ultimately the spoiler with this talk is that you're gonna find that much of this is true across the board with people of color. What we know and what we don't know and the same barriers that hold true as we think about mental health generally, but OCD specifically, 
So there's that part. And then we're gonna talk about treatment considerations and open it up for some questions. So let's go in. So what is OCD? Well, in order to talk about what OCD is, you have to talk about what OCD isn't. So with that being said, first of all, one of the number one myths with OCD is it's about hand washing, right? Being clean, being neat. And that's what most people stereotypically think of when we think about OCD. Well, in reality, that is a subtype of OCD, what we call contamination. But we also know that there's several subtypes of OCD, including perfectionism, harm coming to suffer others. So experiencing what we'll talk about in a bit, what we call intrusive thoughts of not only harming myself unintentionally, but also somebody else. And we'll get into some details of that shortly. The loss of control over actions can be a form of OCD. Violent or sexual obsessions, including things like, what if I'm a pedophile, right? Not actually being a pedophile, but intrusive thoughts of what if I am, right? These are really debilitating symptoms that we're talking about. And then of course, one that we talk quite a bit about these days too, called religious obsessions, also known as scrupulosity. This idea that what if, I, if I'm a Christian, for example, what if I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What if I committed the unpardonable sin and these sort of things that leave people absolutely debilitated with the symptoms that they have? Those are other forms of OCD. So no, it is not just about contamination and it's not just about cleaning. So that's one myth that's very important for us to think through. Secondly, another myth that we talk about with OCD is, well, we're a little OCD at times, right? Like you're so OCD or you're a little bit OCD. That's also fake news too. The truth is that OCD is not a trait, right? It's not a part of somebody's personality. Like somebody says it and I hear it often, right? I'm so OCD. When in reality, you're not so OCD. It's not a quirk. It's not something that you kind of are off at times. It's more so it's a, it's a debilitating mental health condition it affects 3 million people roughly per year, right? Some people have obsessive and compulsive traits. So there's traits that people can have of OCD. And we oftentimes confuse that with a completely different diagnosis, which is what we call obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which is more characterized by orderliness, perfectionism, and control. But that's not OCD. So a lot of times people confuse people who like to be tidy and neat and things like that with being diagnosed with OCD and they're not the same thing. So OCD is not something you turn on and off like a switch. So many times when people say that, you can see that that increases the stigma associated with OCD, even people making comments to you if you actually have OCD related to, can't you just stop being OCD? No, if I could, then I would, right? So that's another myth that's important to think through. The third myth, and I'm using my own language here, but people with OCD need to just chill out or relax or stop overthinking, right? So oftentimes we hear that and that's not it. OCD is not an overreaction to stress. It's not something that again, like a switch that someone can turn on and turn off, right? OCD involves intrusive thoughts known as obsessions and compulsions, which I call rituals, and they lead to significant distress and impairment and functioning. So in other words, it messes things up, like whether it be with work, with relationships, with your ability to interact with people you care about and so on and so forth. Because people with OCD, they feel compelled to engage in these actions, right? It's the things that the thought, which we'll talk about shortly, compels me to do something about it to feel better, which we'll get into that. But it's kind of like saying, if you tell somebody who's depressed, just be positive, right? They're probably gonna look at you sideways because it's not like they've thought of that already. It's not just a matter of not thinking things, right? It's not just a matter of turning thoughts on and off. If they had the ability to do that, we all know that they would, right? So. Keep in mind, OCD is not just saying you just need to chill out or relax because it's not that simple, all right? So basically what I'm saying in a nutshell, and IOCDF is very good about this public education campaign, but basically OCD is not an adjective, right? It's not just being neat and you have a choice and an excuse for things so you can get away with stuff and you, you know, low-key gaslighting and things like that. It's not just overthinking, right? It's not an adjective. It's a serious debilitating mental health condition that many of us don't know a whole lot about, but we do now. So this is why I'm excited about having this conversation today. All right, so let's talk about then what OCD actually is, okay? So OCD affects approximately 2% of the population. So what OCD actually involves is the first association, which we'll get into detail about, involves obsessions. Obsessions are intrusive thoughts, images, urges, or impulses that increase one's anxiety. In other words, the thought or the image or the urge itself creates significant distress, right? The thought that I'm having that 
Um, maybe I'm going to hell triggers intense distress. The thought that I'm having this idea that what if I push somebody in front of a, a bus, like that creates significant distress. Keep in mind, it's intrusive because that means that that's something the person would never do or they would want to do. It's a matter of the thought saying, what if I did that, which creates significant distress. Compulsions, on the other hand, are the things we do in response to those intrusive thoughts. So in other words, it's a repetitive behavioral or mental act that's aimed at decreasing that distress <clears throat> caused by the obsessions, right? So the stereotypical example of one of the myths we just talked about, about OCD just being about contamination, is this idea that, well, I got to repeatedly wash my hands over and over and over. Well, that's a stereotypical example, but it's a good one in the sense that if somebody has contamination obsessions and intrusive thoughts of being contaminated or having a virus of some sort, then if that person has learned to associate hand washing with feeling better, then that's what they would do repeatedly until it feels just right, right? So these rituals and these intrusive thoughts, they take a whole lot of time. They're time consuming. They take at least an hour a day. So they're significantly distressing in that regard. And like I said, it impairs your functioning, meaning things are messed up in your life, whether it be relationships, work, spirituality, the things that we do on a regular basis are significantly impacted by the symptoms, right? So it's a very, very, very debilitating condition in that regard. So this will kind of help us remember what we mean when we think through OCD. Oftentimes when we're working with clients with OCD, we illustrate very simply that if you're diagnosed with OCD, there's two associations within OCD that are important to remember. Number one, you have obsessions. And as you can see, obsessions or intrusive thoughts, images, urges, or impulses lead to distress or anxiety, right? The thought itself makes me really uncomfortable. The second association, is this idea that compulsions, also known as rituals, right? Emotional behaviors is another way to think about that, are aimed at giving me what we call, and this word is very important, temporary relief. And it is clear that the relief that we get from engaging in the compulsions are temporary. Case in point, if we use the hand washing example, like if someone feels contaminated, they interacted with say a trash can or they bumped up against something they thought that could kill them, for instance, and they say, oh, I got to wash my hands. Then what happens is they wash their hands, not a set amount of times per se, but until I feel more comfortable, right? So it could be literally like 20 minutes for some people. I've seen people wash hands for 30 minutes, right? It could be three times turning the faucet on and off or whatever it may be, but they feel more comfortable. But the relief they get from that is temporary, meaning the next time they get triggered, they go back to having to do that ritual, right? So it never, it's a vicious cycle of really making me feel better short term, but it backfires and makes me feel worse. So we talk about this OCD cycle. So basically it looks like this. We get a, an obsession, obsessive thought or an intrusive thought. It leads to distress like we just talked about. That distress is like, what do I do about it? I want to feel better. What do I need to do? Oh, I got it. I've learned to associate this action with relief, so I'll engage in that action, but, and it gives me that relief, but then I get triggered again, and then I go back to that cycle, right? Does that make sense? So in other words, those thoughts lead to the distress, the distress leads to trying to do something to feel better, I do something to feel better, but that's temporary because I go back to having to do it again. All right, so the gold standard treatment of OCD, and this is absolutely the gold standard, and when I say gold standard, what we mean is the best available treatment, right? The first line treatment for pretty much any mental health condition, of course, is medication, psychotropic medication and things along those lines. But the best treatment is what's called exposure and response prevention, also known as ERP. And it's the gold standard. So the simple version is basically saying we create a list of situations that are known to trigger those intrusive thoughts and the rituals that one may have and you teach the person how to engage in confronting through what we call exposure to those things that trigger the thoughts and the rituals without performing the rituals. Essentially what happens when you do that enough times is a couple of things. Number one, they find that they can tolerate the distress associated with the thought. In other words, the feared outcome that I have, like I'm gonna die because I got this virus, doesn't actually in fact happen. So I can tolerate being uncomfortable. And the more I repeatedly confront those situations to trigger those thoughts, it decreases the distress, but most importantly, it teaches me a new non-threatening association. In other words, if I had the thought of, say, going to hell, if I had the thought of 
being involved in a hit and run and they're going to come get me. I've had a thought of being contaminated, right? That those things, in fact, are tolerable and those thoughts aren't, in fact, dangerous. So it's really important to understand we call that process extinction. So in other words, the more I confront those situations, the less likely I'm going to respond the same way and have way less distress associated with it. So there's an example. So if I get triggered, so on that x-axis at the bottom, we have time and we have emotions on the y-axis over there. Essentially what happens is that if I have symptoms of OCD or any sort of emotional disorder like anxiety disorders, what happens is when my distress reaches that intense peak, it's like I can't take it anymore. What am I going to do? What am I going to do about it? What happens is if I engage in avoidance or a ritual of some sort, that does give me some temporary relief with that emotional experience. But the problem is that my brain starts associating that intense emotion with the ritual. So the next time I feel that way, I got to go back to doing the ritual to get a sense of relief. But notice, though, it never really gets rid of what we call the natural course of an emotion, which is this. Essentially, what happens if I don't do a ritual and I stay in an uncomfortable situation is that we know that emotions ebb and flow, right? They, they rise like a wave, but they decrease in intensity. So basically, to use a football metaphor, and it's like saying a quarterback, if you're a football fan, will stay in the pocket. Well, they might get hit when they stay in the pocket to complete a pass, but they just scored a touchdown, though. That's what I like to tell people sometimes. In other words, it's uncomfortable to experience that intense emotion. But if I don't engage in a ritual and stay, notice what that line does. My distress naturally goes down on its own. If I'm engaging in rituals, I never allow that process to take place. And I've convinced myself that I can't tolerate that from happening. And when you do that repeatedly, this is what it looks like. In other words, my distress goes up, it ebbs and flows, goes down. You confront the same situation again. It goes up, but not as high, comes down a third time and a fourth time. And as you can see, that's the natural course of an emotion. So my brain stops reminding me that this thought leads to this extremely negative outcome because when I confront it enough times, that distress in my body starts to dissipate. So that's essentially what we know about how to confront anything, not only related to OCD, but also other anxiety and related disorders. So along those lines, if we think about those obsessions, essentially exposure, confronting those situations, that trigger that intense distress is meant to sever that first association. In other words, the more I confront things that trigger those intrusive thoughts, the less anxious I become over time. Secondly, simple but not easy, is ritual prevention, which is the second part of treatment, is getting you to eliminate rituals at all costs. Well, what if I can't take it? I promise you it feels as if you can't, but you in fact can. And I know Dr. Maggie and Dr. Magda can attest to this as well, but you know, seeing someone with OCD you know, sit in the pocket and stay with distress and then not ritualize and seeing the freedom that they have as a result is absolutely a blessing to watch because they've been tolerating this distress for so long and they learn they can actually, in fact, tolerate it without doing a ritual, right? And oh, by the way, the negative outcome doesn't in fact happen. So that's how ERP works in a nutshell. So along those lines, just to give you another example of that, you know, I've mentioned much of this already, but to give an example, of how this would work with say someone who has harm obsessions. So an obsession could be, well, what if I harm my child? Like what if I hurt them, right? So I've seen people, clients, plenty of clients who are afraid to get too close to their child because what if I hug them or what if I take this knife from the dishwasher and, and stab them with it? Like even that intense. And again, the intent is not to do that. It's the intrusive thought of what if I did that? So they avoid them at all costs. Well, the ritual would be, well, I don't hug my kids, right? I don't use sharp objects around them. So what will we do in treatment? Well, hypothetically, some examples would be I'd intentionally have to learn to hug my child, even with the thought in mind, uh, holding a sharp object around my child. Oh, that sounds horrible. It's definitely uncomfortable, but they learn that the outcome never happens and the distress goes down. Reading articles about parents who've harmed their kids, increasing one's heart rate on purpose, and then holding a sharp object around my child. Like these are all examples of actual exposures that we would use to teach them a new non-threatening association. In other words, you're not gonna harm your child despite what that intrusive thought would say. And then of course, secondly, antidepressant medication, and most people do a combo, right? Like a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRIs as we call them, is the medication most people would take when they're getting treated for OCD. And many clients we see do a combination of the two, right? Because it dampens the distress part, what we call negative affect. I don't feel it's bad, right? 
when I have the symptoms of OCD, if I take some medications, but the ERP is the driving force uh, behind what's actually working with most of it. So that's the treatment in a nutshell. All right. So let's talk about some facts about OCD. Like with anything that you do, any sort of talk, it's always important to lay out foundation. So I just want to reiterate, I think all of that's important because our understanding of, of what OCD is, knowing facts about OCD and what the treatment is will help us understand, well, how does that affect Black folks specifically? And what do we know about that? And we're going to get into that in a minute. So one in 100 adults roughly with OCD, and again, as I said earlier, that's roughly about 3 million people. Uh, studies suggest, and I think Richard mentioned this, he said that he had a, a buddy that said something about like nine years, I think he said, well, look at this. Roughly, it takes about 15 years for most people to find treatment, 15 years. So you're talking about, and Richard, he nailed it, suffered in silence, like people with OCD suffer in silence. And when we say 15 years, part of that is stigma, right? Especially with us often, when I say us talking about black folks and people of color and BIPOC, there's still a stigma associated with acknowledging many mental health conditions, definitely. And I'm so grateful that it's decreased significantly, right? But it's still there. So part of it is that, but the other part of it is going to providers who don't know how to treat it. So again, it says 15 years to find effective treatment, right? Because with OCD treatment, it's not just talk therapy. You're doing a whole lot of practical things and doing a lot of home visits and you're out in the community when you're treating OCD. So 70% though, and that's the staggering statistic though, of people who struggle with OCD though, benefit from ERP, medication or the combo of the two. So in other words, it's very treatable and like what we know with most OCD and related disorders and anxiety disorders is that more people struggle with those sorts of, sort of symptoms than anything else. And yet not all people, only about a third get treatment and yet it's very treatable. Right. So this should be motivating. And then we have one in 200 kids, more than the number of kids who are diagnosed with diabetes. Think about that, because mental health is still trying to catch up and be known as something that's just as important in many ways, more important than a physical health condition. But more kids basically have OCD than diabetes. And that's an extremely important point that I think we um, have to acknowledge. All right. And, and here's the, the spoiler but it affects men, women, and children of all races and ethnicities. So this is not a diagnosis, OCD, something that only certain folks have. It affects all of us, right? So I'm glad I like what Richard had to say about that. All right, so with that being said, um, just to share just something else that's related to OCD is because OCD has its own category and it's known as obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders. You've heard me say the related part multiple times. Well, some examples of that are hoarding disorder. So I think most of us have seen examples like on the show Hoarders, for instance, well, that's exactly what it is, right? Hoarding disorder is an obsessive compulsive related disorder. In other words, it shares common attributes as OCD, but it's not exactly like OCD. And there's some treatment components that are similar, but definitely different. So basically it's difficulty getting rid of items that are no longer useful, clutter in the home. And of course it causes significant distress not only is it an acquiring problem, it's a clutter problem and a difficulty getting rid of things. There's also what's known as body dysmorphic disorder. And that's this idea that I have this extreme concern about perceived minor, so actual flaws or no flaws at all, but physical flaws in appearance. So people take, get these intrusive thoughts related to taking you know, this perceived flaw to extreme lengths, like multiple plastic surgeries, right? like trying to alter my face or a part of my body as much as I possibly can, seeking reassurance to feel better from other people and things like that. And then we also have what's called BFRBs or body focused repetitive behavior. So things like hair pulling, where people actually are pulling out their hair to the, it being gone, like eyelashes, eyebrows, excoriation, also known as skin picking, right? Or dermatillomania, where, you know, we work with clients who like literally pull out finger and toenails, right? Like real hardcore stuff like that or and things like that and picking at their skin, their face, their stomachs, their legs, and they have to cover up and such because it causes social negative social consequences. So these are some other disorders that I would be remiss not to mention. So it's ultimately important to know that OCD has other related disorders that are in that same category, some of which have similar treatment components, but some of these actually have their um, unique ingredients as well. All right, so it's kind of the drum roll. Okay, so what do we know about OCD in Black Americans? This is where folks are, 
picking up pins and stuff and, and about to write some things. So here's my joke. All right, 115 of y'all should laugh, but it's common, but it's not that common, right? Some of y'all get that. All right, so it's common, but it's not that common. So I say that to say, let's talk about the prevalence of OCD in the black community. All right, so this will not be a shock, I hope, to anybody, but research with OCD with black Americans has been scarce. <laughs> I mean, it has but that's been true for most mental health conditions, but especially OCD, right, until recently. So one of the very first studies, Lewis Hall and colleagues, and this was in 1991, that examined OCD in African-Americans only found that 2% of the clinical population in that study was diagnosed with OCD. They had other mental health conditions, and I'll talk about a lot of those in this, in this talk as well, because it's really important to make note of what those conditions were. Also, we do know this though, overall, OCD appears to be consistent across ethnic groups in the United States. I gave you the statistic earlier, 1.6 to 2% roughly is what we're talking about. That's good news, right? In a sense, because what it says is that people aren't disproportionately affected by OCD, but as we probably could guess, it still suggests though that there's barriers that remain for treatment and we'll get into that. So African-American and Black Caribbeans have shown a lifetime prevalence rate again, 1.6%. So again, being a scientist myself, doing much of the research that we're talking about, it's gratifying to know that if I'm working with some black folks and do the right assessments and so on and so forth and have the right relationship, you find out people are struggling, right? You find out people have the same symptoms. That's good news, but it's also bad news because when we think about treatment, though the treatment is effective, right? We find that many people have access difficulties and there's reasons why we show, show certain symptoms more so than others, which we'll talk about in a second. So the short of it is that the prevalence rate is pretty consistent, so that's good. What about symptoms though? And this is kind of the crux of everything that I really wanted to share. So this is the most important part in my opinion. All right, so in general, symptoms of OCD are similar, right, in black folks in content. In other words, there's no different content per se in terms of the types of intrusive thoughts or the types of rituals. Again, and if you're a scientist, you probably would say, well, that, but that is good news, right? Because that means that it's the same type of symptom categories and clusters. My colleague, Monica Williams, and her group at the time, uh, they found six symptom dimensions that was consistent, right? In other words, these same symptom dimensions are the same OCD symptom dimensions that are consistent in non-Hispanic whites. So again, contamination and washing, right? The most common type we often see, hoarding symptoms, right? Sexual slash reassurance symptoms, aggression, mental compulsion, symmetry and perfectionism, doubt and checking. These are all categories that we're already very aware of and familiar with in general with OCD and non-Hispanic white folks. But this is something that's very important, this 2012 study, because what it said is that, wait a second, if we can, actually capture the symptomology in Black folks in the Black, Black population, it's important to see that the symptoms are very consistent and similar to what we see with non-Hispanic whites. So that's very important. So we do know that. Now, with that being said, this is very important content here because there's four major findings that are specific to Black Americans that's really important to consider. Number one, Black Americans with OCD report twice as high contamination concerns than non-Hispanic whites. So in other words, though the content of contamination is consistent, right? They report twice as high contamination concerns than their white counterparts. So that's a very important point. And we'll get into some cultural explanation as to why that might be the case. Secondly, black folks tend to express more animal related fears than non-Hispanic whites. Um, this has been consistent in the literature. There's some research I've done in that area that I'll highlight in a minute. And along with that, higher disgust sensitivity. Now, disgust is interesting because when we think about core emotional experiences, rarely do we talk about disgust and its role in contributing to mental health conditions. So what I mean by that is we talk about anxiety sensitivity quite often, meaning being sensitive to the somatic or bodily sensations that are related to anxiety and deeming those as dangerous and having negative social consequences, meaning my heart's beating fast, that must mean, right? My stomach is nauseous, that must mean, or you know, my, I'm having shortness of breath, that must mean, and typically it's some form of death, right? Like it means I'm in danger of some sort. 
Well, disgust is another very important emotion because think about the emotion of disgust. Disgust is an important emotion. It's related to contamination, right? It's related to certain animals, right? It's related to these things when we get sick. So reporting a higher disgust sensitivity or sensitivity to the emotion known as disgust is something else that we have found. And we'll talk about some sociocultural reasons for that too. Also, what we know is that there's higher rates, high rates, not higher, but high rates of comorbidity with other diagnoses in addition to OCD, meaning Black Americans in particular, when they have a diagnosis of OCD, we tend to also experience other types of anxiety disorders, right? So social anxiety, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, specific phobias of things, which we'll also talk about briefly. So it's really important to note that when you're diagnosed with OCD, and not only for BIPOC generally, but Black folks specifically, there's oftentimes other diagnoses that are shared. It's not just OCD, right? In other words, we're coming with some other things too, and we'll talk about some explanations for that. And then finally, and again, this is not um, a, a newsflash at all, but less likely to seek treatment for OCD, right? Richard did a good job of highlighting that. There's a lot of reasons for that, and we'll get into that as well. All right, so let's just go for the throat, all right? So when we think about some of these findings we're talking about with contamination and disgust sensitivity and whatnot, whatnot, it's important to recognize that Black Americans have a very unique history with the United States. And when we think about how things are transmitted, which we'll talk about in a minute as it relates to anxiety and OCD and related disorders, you know, many times we'll find that these things run in families. Ultimately, messages is also transmitted, right? So when we think about during the Jim Crow era and such, like this, essentially this obsession in many ways, no pun intended, with non-Hispanic whites often in, during that time, and this, this idea that Black folks are somehow contaminated, right, or disgusting, like that picture, that epic picture there with throwing bleach in the swimming pool when they were getting integrated, like these sort of things are messages that were found throughout history right, with African Americans in particular that are communicated over time, right? So in many ways, when we think about this excessive idea coming from non-Hispanic whites at times of the time, you know, saying, oh, well, y'all contaminate, you have to drink from a different water fountain, you have to go into a different entrance, right? These are things that can certainly be transmitted and be, be very important messages, right? So it's very important to understand that fear acquisition works the exact same way. If I'm communicating these messages over time, and I'll give some personal examples, then that actually communicates that things might in fact be threatening. I love this picture because they're obviously on this roller coaster not feeling it. So with that being said, contamination concerns in Black Americans are consistent with what we call fear acquisition models, which I'm going to explain to you. So here's what we know, and this is a lot of the research I've done, is that in general, children of anxious parents are three times, so three to seven times actually, more likely to develop an anxiety disorder than a child of a non-anxious parent. In other words, if my parent has an anxiety disorder diagnosis, whether or not it's diagnosed or if they have it and it's not diagnosed, the bottom line is that my child is more than likely going to experience it as well. Now, the seductive part of what I'm trying to say there is that sounds super genetic, right? My parent's anxious, she's passing on this anxious gene. That's not in fact true. The tendency to be anxious is present genetically, but the pathway through which anxiety typically occurs is one of these three pathways and, and not mutually exclusive pathways. In other words, you can have all three. Traumatic experiences, observational learning, and informational transmission, and I'll explain that. So again, to highlight these findings, <clears throat> given the uniqueness that Black Americans have had in this country, right, all the way from the African diaspora, through the Jim Crow era, even to today and the way that we see it today with social justice and the things, thank God for social media, because ultimately what we know is that these messages can be transmitted the same way anxiety is. <clears throat> so when we talk about traumatic experiences, I think it's pretty clear what we mean by that. So for instance, if you know I'm seeing, for instance, if I have an experience myself with a police officer, if I have a negative experience with you know, being discriminated against, which we'll talk about in a bit, or I've had these experiences with my parents, watching that happen to them, watching other Black folks being killed, watch other people being discriminated against. Believe it or not, if I have a tendency toward experiencing anxiety and related symptoms, that's a powerful learning experience that in and of itself could trigger me manifesting many concerns myself. 
So modeling is what we call it, watching someone else react to fear, right? Having a traumatic experience personally happen to me can also trigger that distress or even informational transmission. Two things that my mom used to say all the time. My mom would say, boy, you better put a coat on or you're going to get pneumonia, right? I know, you know, 117 of y'all know what I'm talking about. So I say that to say that we know today that's not how you get pneumonia, but take the example. With my mama communicating to me that way, what that infers as a child is, oh, if I don't wear a coat, then that must lead to threat or danger. Does that make sense? So I say that to say that that's what we call informational transmission or the be, beware of the dogs. I grew up in an urban area in West Louisville, right? Where there's a lot of alleys you know, with the beware of the dogs. I stay away from Mr. Jenkins' dog because, right? Like he'll jump the fence and you boom, boom, boom. So because of that, that's something that's transmitted, right? And that's essentially what could take place with many of these messages that we've heard over time throughout the history of this country is that when we see things like higher contamination concerns, higher disgust sensitivity, there's so sociocultural explanations for that, meaning it's not pathological at all per se, it's because of the social, sociocultural communication that is taking place with black folks over, the, over time. So I say that to say that contamination concerns are likely due to the historical messages of racism and discrimination toward black Americans, right? Discuss sensitivity, it's not surprising. If you think about what I just said, it's not surprising in light of the research literature and what we know about our history in this country. And then of course, this other finding, which is also not surprising, that people generally from low socioeconomic status are higher in discuss sensitivity. Cleanliness is more important, right? If you're living in an area that might be dilapidated and such, then it becomes that more, much more important, right? Taking care of what I have, doing what I can to conserve and whatnot, right? And then secondly, fear acquisition models that are relevant to OCD symptoms in Black Americans and other BIPOC, because this is also true for other people of color as well, is that the fear acquisition model, traumatic experiences, right? Observational learning or modeling, and then informational transmission. That's also very important on how that, those messages with OCD are, very, are transmitted as well. All right. So with that being said, what about cultural factors that influence these high rates of comorbidity with Black Americans? In other words, we talked about the finding that is worth our attention that OCD typically comes along with other things as well. Let's talk about it, right? So a lot of the work that I've done with the research literature is that, you know, I found, I've done, in fact, I think it's the one study where we actually had 100 African-American parent-child diets. Like it's the only study I know of in the literature that's done that. And what we found was one in four black Americans will experience an anxiety disorder in their lifetime, right? So the rates that we found in our sample was very consistent with the rates of non-Hispanic white samples, right? It's a matter of building our relationship and having folks talk to you, right? Saying, I'm struggling. Richard said, I'm struggling in silence. So building that relationship and having somebody you trust communicate that effectively is very important. So with that said, social anxiety tends to be one of the more higher comorbid diagnoses that we find in Black Americans. In other words, if we have an OCD diagnosis, social anxiety disorder, which by the way, is a persistent fear of social or performance situations, get this, where negative evaluation may occur. In other words, I'm anxious about being in a social setting where I can be scrutinized. Now, typically the situations that that's including are things like public speaking, initiating or maintaining conversations, uh, group discussions, being assertive and things like that, right? But in our sample, we also found other diagnoses with social anxiety and specific phobia of animals are absolutely the highest, all right? So here's one example. So on one particular study, we, when we looked at, you know, we looked at OCD and we looked at other things as well, what we found is that we took a college sample of Black Americans and then we looked at, took a community sample and we found very similar findings. And here's what these numbers and such mean, I'll explain it. The most important one, and this is so ironic, and I've talked to my family about this too many times, but one, as you'll find, is that there were more fears about specific things in both samples, the community sample and the college age sample, such as a fear of water, right? There was this water problem, right? Strange dogs was a big one, right? Snakes, spiders, rats, things that are what? Disgusting. You see what I'm getting at? And then, of course, social anxiety was also very big in the sample that we saw. But look at the specific items. The people we talked to and interacted with, they were like, look, not being a success, right? Representing is a big social concern of mine. Being self-conscious, which we'll talk about in a minute, is a big concern of mine. Being criticized by people, 
is a big concern of mine and looking foolish. And that was true. And these are years apart, y'all, these studies in a college sample and a community sample. These are real concerns, right? So many times when we're talking about having a social anxiety diagnosis along with OCD and along with a phobia of animals, the seductive part about having a phobia of say like dogs, water is this. You can avoid those things because they're not things you encounter on a regular basis. Right. I have family members talking about put the dog up. Right. So with that being said, they can visit if the dogs put away. So that's just something else to tuck away. So what about African-American children? Same thing. Right. So African-American kids develop anxiety disorders at similar rates as non-Hispanic white children. Our data with the 100 parent child dias that we talked about, 34 percent of them also met criteria for an anxiety disorder. And guess what? Similarity, social anxiety and animal concerns. So we're seeing a pattern, right? We're seeing this pattern, but I don't want us to lose sight of the why the pattern's there, right? And this is really in many ways, the most important piece that I enjoy the most, and that's this. It's because historically, black Americans and other people of color too, have experienced what I call race-based alarms. And here's what I mean by that. Anxiety and related disorders have these, what we call defining moments or an alarm reaction, right? That contributes to this learned association. It's kind of like saying, if I am, if I develop PTSD, then I had to experience a traumatic event for that to be, you know, present. So with that being said, that's what the alarm is. So true alarm is basically the fight or flight reaction in the midst of real danger. All right, real danger. A false alarm, on the other hand, is having that fight or flight in the absence of real danger or threat. Panic attacks are an example. So when we think about panic disorder, that's an example of another talk, but excuse me, a false alarm is essentially the fear response with no danger. And that's what a panic attack is. Fear and panic are the exact same thing. Another conversation. But black Americans experience a number of cultural alarms that are not accounted for whatsoever clinically that lead to anxiety, right? So we talk about race-based stress and trauma. That's what we're talking about with mental health is that we have these alarms that aren't accounted for clinically. So oftentimes we see this from in a clinical setting and, and a lot of clinicians aren't really sure what to do with. So what do we mean by trauma? An event that triggers an emotional shock, right? That's a very simple definition. Racial stress and trauma definitely equals an emotional shock triggered by a racist act or comment, right? It's not a diagnosable condition though. So in other words, we have, you know, people of color generally, the black folks specifically being triggered by things on a semi-regular basis that are traumatic in nature, but it doesn't fit criteria for what we would call say like PTSD. So this accounts for many of the things that we're often seeing. In other words, should racial trauma be a part of PTSD? One of the other diagnoses we often see, well, our responses to racism are obviously not pathological, but nonetheless, is something to still consider and how that impacts some of these findings we're seeing with OCD and why it's so much higher with the comorbidities with social anxiety and trauma and things like that, for example having heart palpitations in a social setting when in a predominantly white classroom. Like we see some kids who say that often, right? Like I'm the only, you know, black kid in the whole school or in the own classroom. So is that pathological that I'm having panic symptoms? No. All right. Other examples of race-based trauma, social media exposure to the murder of black people, right? Being ostracized or witnessing parents being discriminated against. There's that observational learning piece. Microaggressions, right? These subtle forms of prejudice is covert, right? features viewed as exotic, oh, I love your hair, things like that. These are all traumatic experiences. Being the first or last student picked in a game, this idea is stereotype threat. You know, we've talked historically about this notion of healthy paranoia, right? And it's called healthy paranoia because it could actually in fact happen, right? Being passed by on the line, hearing a pin drop when you're one of the few African-Americans or another person of color in a situation, right? Seeing rebel flags, I live in Indiana, that's all I'm saying, I see them non-Hispanic whites are asking black folks questions like you represent all black folks. These are all very traumatic experiences. And this definitely accounts for much of what we see symptom wise when we're thinking about why black folks may or may not present to treatment and why we ap appear to have other diagnosable conditions. So now we're gonna transition into cultural factors that influence these higher rates and such in the treatment seeking in black Americans. So again, this is kind of a, a really nice graphic to kind of explain why we're not seeing what we should be seeing. In other words, we still have mental health disparities 
And the reasons being, we have these experiences of racism we just talked about, cultural barriers to treatment that we talked about, right? Um, we have clinical bias error. In other words, we have clinicians who aren't necessarily as savvy at understanding sociocultural factors. So it's like, oh, you got higher rates of contamination. Let's talk about that. Well, let's talk about the sociocultural contributions to it, right? So we have clinicians who aren't culturally proficient in doing that. And of course, like in the research setting, we also see problems with that. So, so what are some other cultural factors influencing these low rates of OCD treatment seeking behaviors? Well, we got attitudes on the one hand, but we have structural barriers on the other hand. So number one, afraid of therapy causing harm or forcing unwanted changes. So this is an attitude that we may be socialized to thinking, right? We got this T Tuskegee project that took place that planted seeds for in black folks for decades as a result. And therefore, until somebody has broken that stigma, or decides to, that's gonna to continue to be somewhat of an attitude due to the fly by night treatment that many people have, right? We'll come and collect data, but then we peace out and don't return. And that's the problem that's historically been the case uh, with black folks in particular, as it relates to us not wanting to be involved in any sort of mental health research. Belief that the clinician won't be able to help, right? What you got for me? How can you help me? The stigma and negative perceptions of the mentally ill in general. So that's stigma, worried about what my family and my, my friends and my homies might think, right? This is a real thing I have friends with conversations about, right? And thankfully, thankfully that stigma has decreased but it continues to persist too. The mistrust of health professionals due to personal and community experiences of racism, I've covered that already. But there's also structural barriers, right? The way that our society is set up, right? to be disadvantageous. So there's this idea of the cost of treatment, the lack of providers in the black community and not just racial match, but also cultural match is an important factor in treatment. So it could be, might not be like an African-American on African-American per se, but if the cultural match is there, then treatment can be just as effective. So again, training people to be culturally proficient, difficulties finding the right treatment. We've talked about that. And then again, racism and discrimination by providers. Some research would suggest that if you take, um, and this was a study that was actually conducted with some doctoral level psychologists, but they showed that black folks with the equal credentials and com uh, chief complaints, calling psychologists, unfortunately, right, had way lower access rates to the therapist. They had way lower callbacks. Uh, black males in the study had way less evening appointments versus everybody else in the sample. So, you know, there is a bias that takes place, whether it be implicit or explicit, but it definitely exists. So in a nutshell, what I'm saying here is when I talk about uh, social justice related stuff, I, I, always, I often talk about the importance of not just being an ally. We love to use the term ally, but I like saying you need to be an accomplice. And, and when it comes to being an accomplice, it means that you're getting your hands dirty. So what am I saying? I'm saying, number one, understand the cultural factors that influence the symptoms of OCD and these other symptoms, meaning the higher rate of disgust, sensitivity, and contamination with OCD within Black folks because there's true alarms, so there's this history of discrimination and racism that needs to be addressed. The messages that have been transmitted to BIPOC generally, this is very important to also consider. Increasing the availability and the affordability of treatment, very important. Education from our perspective, right, as mental health professionals about the treatment process. We can help removing the veil, the stereotype, right, is that we read folks' minds, are you gonna tell me what happened when you were six and I'm gonna have a clipboard and cross my leg and talk to you about your problems and dreams. That's not how it goes, right? Having a very superficial process and talking about, which we do, a very structured, collaborative, help me help you become your own psychologist type of education and people can get down with that, I assure you. So the good news though, is that ERP absolutely is still the gold standard. It's just as effective. Fidelity with flexibility is so incredibly important. And what this concept means for mental health professionals is making sure that you stick to the ingredients of treatment, but being flexible in how we implement it, bringing in sociocultural factors, talking about the experiences with true alarms and cultural alarms and whatnot, the other symptoms and bringing in family members and such who can be very helpful and instrumental in the treatment process, not just doing treatment in the office. Many of us exposure therapists we often do home visits as a rule, not an exception. So it's not just coming to me, we're coming to you, right? Priorities and perspective. Honestly, we gotta prioritize our mental health, right? There's a lot of, there's a whole movement on that. Charlemagne talks a whole lot about it and so do other people, 
Um, but the bottom line is that like we got to we have to make time for our mental health. Like we, you know, as hard as it is, but we got to prioritize our treatment, right? Uh, making therapy less scary, which I've covered. And then of course, cultural competence and humility for all providers, right? This idea of being flexible and normalizing cultural contribution, contributions to, to distress throughout. And just talking about that, making that a part of not something you just assess in the therapy context, but it's something you talk about throughout the entire process of the treatment. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna stop there. And then open it up. Hopefully, I got some stuff out of that. Appreciate it. So, Dr. Chapman, um, Dr. Rodriguez had went through and answered a lot of the questions in the chat. She was on it. Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> if I, I, you have hey, any, I don't see any. Clutch. I, I appreciate her. She's always clutch. Right. She was on it. <laughs> I saw her answering a few. Dr. Rodriguez, do you want to come back on and you guys can maybe um, talk a little bit about the training, um, the BTTI trainings you have while people are still adding questions? And I'll also put, I also put Dr. Chapman, I put your website in the chat, but I'm going to put it again so people can click them as well. Okay. So you say you're throwing up the BTTI? Did, we, did I hear you right? Yes. Am I unmuted? Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Chapman, if you want to go through and take a look at some of my answers, there's a really good question I asked the, um, the uh, Latoya Grigler. She said, I wonder about the role, some of the real challenges for Black people in the U.S., such as the Flint water crisis in Michigan and more toxic and waste plants being disproportionately in people of color's neighborhood impact our fear of contamination. Yeah, absolute facts, right? Mm -hmm. Since we're family at this point, I'll just say that that's facts. Um, that certainly is a great point, Latoya, because that, that's essentially the exact same thing I've been arguing throughout this webinar, is that's a current example of something that's a real true alarm that is a, an actual real threat. In psychology, we oftentimes talk about irrational thoughts and you know these uh, thinking errors like catastrophizing. Oh, you can't predict the future. You don't know this thing's gonna happen. When in reality, what we're saying is like with black folks and other people of color, there are actual crises that are realistic concerns, right? Like I, if I drink this water, it could in fact lead to X, Y, and Z and the data would support that. So that absolutely is an extremely good point. I agree with you, that absolutely would influence higher discussed sensitivity. And in that case, Latoya, it's adaptive because it's something you should be concerned about in that case. And I, I, I think that when, when we talk about taking into account cultural influences, I think it, it is very important to validate, right, those factual concerns that is adaptive right if if you fear of seeing therapists fear of being in a study all of that is adaptive to an extent right the extent is what's the duration of the emotion in other words how long does that anxiety or concern last working through it and discussing it openly in session and also what's the intensity of that emotion how high is that emotion and how long does that last that that tends to affect going from adaptive to maladaptive, right? That's true. And Dr. Magda, to that point, <clears throat> something else I like to use a lot, though, is when I'm talking particularly with, with any client, but particularly clients of color, I make it very clear, we're not going to do cognitive restructuring. <clears throat> we're going to do what's called flexibility training, mm -hmm. because many times our thoughts about these things, like you said, to your point, are need to be flexible, right? I could encounter a situation where somebody discriminates against me. What's the evidence that that's true? Well, it has in fact happened, right? So mm -hmm. it's not about changing thoughts to, oh, I'm not gonna be discriminated against or, oh, I'm not gonna drink bad water because that's not true. It's being flexible. There's been times in the past where this has happened, but maybe it won't, right? That's flexible. That's not necessarily being positive. So it's even like how we describe our interventions at times and acknowledging and normalizing that much of what we struggle with is real sociocultural concern as opposed to some irrational view of things that don't have a high likelihood of happening. 
Absolutely. I think we do have some questions um, that are open. You see them, Dr. Chapman? Yeah, Megan, I'm going to put you on. Oh, you already answered that. Where can one become OCD certified additional training? <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's, um, I have a follow-up question. So per, an individual was interested with on how telehealth has actually affected our ability to provide um, treatment. And they said, I assumed that moving to telehealth caused some barriers to treatment, especially since OCD treatment can often be done in the field. How do you still support, even if we are still telehealth? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> my own view is shout out to SIPACT. I know, Magda, you're familiar with SIPACT, but SIPACT is basically legislation that if you have the right credentialing and such that allows psychologists to see people across state lines in most states, but not all states. Personally, that has been a phenomenal, phenomenal thing that's happened since COVID is that it's allowed us to open up our state lines and to give people access to care. With that being said, I also have been finding, and we don't have a lot of research out yet, but telehealth is very effective, honestly. Like the people that I've seen with telehealth, even people who struggle with OCD, if they're motivated to, to do the treatment and they're motivated to do the ERP and such, then I find that it's effective. Like, uh, granted, like having human interaction in person is very powerful, but I have had a lot of success, and so have my colleagues, with seeing people on telehealth. So for me, I think that it's been less of a barrier if people can have the access. It's opened up more options for people to still get effective evidence-based treatment. So that's a that's a I'm I'm shouting the praises of the telehealth part because it's really been able to allow us to help more people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it gives us the opportunity to be able to enter their world and do exposures right in yep. their own spaces um so that that's been helpful too yep, I agree. Uh, there was a question about how treatment differs uh between children and adults yeah so primarily the way we think about it and certainly magda you can help me with this if you want but with ultimately what we know is that the treatment ingredients are very consistent the difference is the developmental applicability of the treatment ingredient so in other words you're not going to talk about exposure and response prevention the same way to a kid as you would to an adult. Now, I would say that the exception to that is a high functioning adolescent, like a teenager, for instance. I tend to treat them more like an adult if they want to do the treatment. But if they're younger, you certainly have to do it more developmentally. You talk more about bodily sensations and you talk about the amygdala and you talk about what that really means when you're working with a younger kiddo and things like that. So the ingredients are very consistent, but you use developmentally appropriate language like having a false alarm, right? Like that's your brain misfiring and telling your body that this is dangerous. When you see how my voice is changing, and y'all see how I go with kids. Mm -hmm. But I say that to say that the ingredients of treatment are just as, as effective for kids. And granted, there's more challenges with kids, though, of course, because, you know, you're not just treating the child, right? You got the family involvement. And oftentimes parents who are well-knowing and caregivers who love their children they often are giving accommodations and reassurance that actually sabotages treatment to some degree. So you got to teach a lot of rules and create boundaries to help parents be a co-pilot in the enterprise of helping their child overcome OCD. Right, right. I think that parental component where you're <laughs> doing a lot of psychoeducation and mainly helping um, the parents or the caregivers see that it is just as loving not to reassure and give into requests. So setting limits and empowering them, parents again, to learn to live life and not walk on eggshells. Right. I think that's also another component to, to include there, right? Absolutely true. Um, there was a question on, um, let's see. For diagnosis, it says having both obsession and compulsions, does it have to happen over time to meet the criteria? Is there a time it has to occur to be diagnosed over a month, a year? And just to combine to another question along the same lines, does it have to be an hour or more? Or can it be 45 minutes, three times a week? I love that question. That's a great question because... Um, <laughs> because our diagnostic criteria is very rigid, to be honest. And really we use it as a guide 
bottom line, and I know Dr. Magda will co-sign this, is that no, it doesn't have to necessarily have a certain time frame. We use time frames like over a month, between mm -hmm. a month and six months, more than six months. But the bottom line is the two most important criteria for OCD and any other mental health condition is does it cause A, personal distress? In other words, are you bothered by it? And B, does it create impairment in functioning? Are there things that you normally do that are no longer possible or much more difficult because you struggle with the distress that you have? If you check those boxes, it doesn't make any difference if you have extremely severe diagnosable OCD versus mild to moderate because the bottom line is that if it's personally distressing and it's messing up some area and it's causing you to come for treatment, that means treatment will be beneficial to you. Absolutely. I think quality of life, values-based living, yep. that's what we're looking at. Um, yep. All right. What are your thoughts on therapists expressing to clients that when doing ERP, their anxiety will eventually go, quote unquote, go away versus telling clients the intensity of their feelings will decrease? Sorry. Wow. Over time. That <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a sophisticated question right it there. It is. No, Craig. Hey, so here's the deal. I, I love that question. Mm. So, wow, that's like somebody planted that question. So my <laughs> personal opinion about that is I, I, I agree with, I think, with the heart behind what Craig's saying, because I think that it's misleading to say that the distress will go away and older models of OCD treatment focus on what we call habituation. This idea that when you repeatedly confront a situation, your distress response goes down and therefore, well, here's the irony of that, not to get into this details in another webinar, but there's about four to five different ways we can get somebody's distress to come back if we don't account for other things throughout treatment. So I say that to say that it is misleading to say that, oh yeah, do it until the distress goes down. Because the bottom line is that what you're trying to teach from what we call an inhibitory learning perspective is you're trying to teach the client that they can not only tolerate the distress, but also we're trying to teach their brain a new non-threatening association. In other words, the OCD triggers take on two meanings. The one meaning that, oh, this is threatening and dangerous. But what happens is that the second meaning overrides that meaning. And it's like that memory association is still there that this is distressing. But the new meaning is it's not dangerous. I can in fact tolerate it and I don't have to listen to it. And that's way more palatable to, to a client, especially when they're like, but my distress isn't going down. Because we, we know for a fact that the whole purpose is not necessarily to eliminate the distress because that distress is necessary at times. It's more so distress tolerance and teaching a new non-threatening association that competes for attention with this old association. That's the cliff notes. I could, I could go with 10 slides about that, but I 100% agree with that point. Yeah. So anxiety tolerance, right? Yep. Um, let's see. So what about clients who have a fear of something going wrong when things are going well? So a client who has had some terrible things happen, things are going well, but they are now worried the other shoe is going to drop. I've seen this yep. make with my black clients and I wonder if it's connected to that perfectionism thing. Well, it could be connected to the perfectionism thing, but it also could be a part of just a traumatic experience that many black folks have, right? So in many ways, it's this calm before the storm, so to speak, because oftentimes we should validate that there are patterns like that throughout our lives as black folks and people of color, right? It's like we go a season in a certain area where there's things that are going really smoothly and then boom, and then another one, boom. This is where the flexible part comes in though, because I think that this is where changing thoughts, not positive thoughts, like, oh, nothing's gonna happen to me, I'm Gucci, right? No, things can happen to you. I think the key is that I'm flexible and expecting that the data that I have would be consistent with bad things not happening mostly. And if it does in fact happen, I have skills to tolerate it. And that's huge because oftentimes we get into what we call catastrophizing. Not only is this problem so like the, the biggest problem I can encounter, but I'm ill-equipped to deal with it. And I think that that's where cognitive strategies are helpful by teaching, well, this problem is uncomfortable, but you have skills to also navigate it. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that that is empowering, but it's also important to semantically call it that. Let's teach you flexible thinking, not positive. And, and teaching disconforming expectations, right? You have one expectation right. and really there are multiple expectations. And yeah. um, we're, we're using and instead of but or, right? We're inclusive in the experience of life and the spectrum of emotion and allowing yourself to be flexible and have a confidence that either way, you'll be able to handle it. You'll be all right. Right, yeah, you said it back, the expectancy violation. We're big on that, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I, I, Roxana, we have about two minutes um, and I know there is a wrap up section that you wanted to? Yes. So we wanted to let people know about your upcoming trainings, which we did put the link in the chat. Um, also, Richard Rowe wanted to talk about a little bit about um, reaching out, following up with Black Mental Health Alliance. Dr. Chapman did an awesome job talking about um, the Black experience with that OCD diagnosis. We um, we're just going back and forth on our phones, like, oh my gosh, this is so good. So thank you so much, Dr. Chapman. <laughs> That's what's up. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed it. And I hope y'all got something out of it. Yeah, Dr. Chapman. Definitely. I'm sorry, Dr. Chapman. We were unfair to you, sir. One hour. Right. This is a training or session that could easily take three, four days. Um, but you it. did it in one hour, sir, brother. And again, we want to thank you immensely for sharing all this great information. You didn't even get into some of the topics that you could have, or I mean, your, <laughs> sum, your, your summary page, could we could have parked ourselves there for an hour right. because there was a listing of some great things that we can do. The bad news you all is that race-based trauma uh, contributes to uh, OCD uh, and we could talk more about that, but we could not. Dr. Chapman did the best he could. He could talk more about structural barriers, attitudes. That is an important area that we need to focus attention on. He could have talked talk more about the imposter syndrome or the stereotype threat. All these things could have been lifted up and talked about more, but we, want, we are proud and grateful to you, sir, and honor you for basically bringing this great information to over 200 folks on a Friday afternoon, 200 plus folks attended 375 folks basically signed on. I could say a lot more, but I'm not supposed to talk long. But Dr. Chapman, <laughs> please, brother, please understand how grateful we are to you and to all of you all who basically uh, supported this uh, this webinar to the OCD uh, Mid-Atlantic uh, organization. We are, uh, uh, we are proud to be a part of uh, your this partnership. Uh, we are grateful to you all for allowing us to, to be a partner with you all. To everybody who supported this, I know we are out of time. Dr. Chapman, we know we will see you again, uh, we, not with, hopefully within the near future. Roxana, thank you. Uh, uh, Black Men Health Alliance, one, again, wants to extend our tremendous support uh, and gratitude to everybody who uh, signed on. Uh, CEUs, don't forget, if you want a CEU, you need to simply yeah. make sure to contact us. Uh, I think Cheryl Maxwell gave her uh, email address at the very beginning, but we will make certain that that information is shared with you again. Roxana, is there any other parting information that we need to share before we let everybody go? Nope, that was it. And you will get a follow-up email with the CEU information, with Dr. Chapman's information, with OCD, Mid-Atlantic information, and um, Black Mental Health Alliance. So that will be coming out on Monday. Thank you all. We hate to, you don't have to leave. You don't have to go home, but you know, this, this, <laughs> this, 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 this webinar is over. I know you want to stay. Uh, but Dr. Chapman, <laughs> he's got to, he's got other things to do. He's got to do. Right. He's and got he, to go. he had some good jokes in there. I like the. I know. I know. Yes, I liked it. I liked it. Good job. We got to bring the comedy. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. 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 Everybody be safe. Everybody be well. Have a great weekend. Yeah. All right. Take care, y'all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye. Wow.